Let's do this. Let's, let's go to uh, Matthew uh, 28. Matthew 28 is where we started about 20 weeks ago. It was October 30th of 2013 when we started this series, Absolute Authority. And we started here with an amazing claim of Jesus Christ. And I want to, uh, we started there, let's end it right there. Okay? Let's end it right there. Matthew 28, um, verse 18. If you have a Bible, use it. If you don't, use one of these. The page is up on the, the, page is up on the screen. You might be fancy and have an uh, electronic device. That's cool, too. Um, but if you guys are there, um, if you're ready to dive in, are you ready? Okay. Here, here's what Jesus says uh, in Matthew 28, 18. And if you don't have it underlined or highlighted, it should be. Uh, this is a massive one. This is a huge, huge thing. Uh, it says this. Uh, Jesus came and told his disciples. So he's not telling, like, the pastor. He's not telling the leader. He's telling his followers, his students, the ones who are following him, learning from him, which is everyone in this room right now, okay? So he's speaking to them, and he's speaking to you, and he says this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, that's every single person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And before we jump into the absolute authority thing, I want to ask you, has anyone ever been at a job when you've got like multiple bosses and they're all telling you to do something and they differ? Yeah. Okay, you've been there, right? And all, I mean, most of the people in the room have had some, like, you've got three bosses, like your immediate manager or supervisor, then his boss and her boss, and they're all telling you what to do and you just go, man, I don't even know what to do. I'm afraid to do what she said because I might get in trouble from her. If I do what she says, I might get in trouble from him. And, you know, I don't even know what to do anymore. And so what Jesus says right here is, okay, I get it. I get that you have different bosses at different levels, but all authority. Like, I am the CEO of this little company I started. You might have heard of it. It's called the universe. He says, I am the boss, the top dog of any supervisor that you have. And so therefore, just disregard everything they've told you and always do what I say. Don't listen to your wife if she contradicts what I say. Don't listen to your husband if it contradicts what I say. Don't listen to your boss. Don't listen to your coach. Don't listen to your pastor. Don't listen to anybody. If I tell you what to do, that is what you do. I have all authority everywhere in every single thing. Okay? Can I throw authority? See, if you don't know what authority is, it's worthless. It's just being yelling at you. I started 20 weeks ago, I told you, a definition. Can we throw it up on the screen? I think it should be up there. Can you throw up authority definition up on the screen, Mark? Yeah. Okay, that, that's it. Okay, authority means that I have the power to judge. This is Jesus speaking. I have the power to judge. I have the power to control things. I have the power to command things. And I have the power to determine things. Okay, now, that's in our Bible. In, in, in like a King James, which some of you may read, it doesn't say I've, I've been given all authority. It says I've been given all power. Okay, I've been given all power. That's the Greek word exousia. Exousia says this. It means uh, I have all force. I have all capacity. I, this is cool. In the Strong's Concordance, you wouldn't expect to see this. It says superhuman. That was kind of cool, right? Jesus is a superhero. Uh, he says I have all liberty. I have all power, of course. I have all rights. And I have all strength. And then my favorite one is I have all freedom. So not only do I have the ability and the resources to do all these things, but I have the freedom to do it if I desire. And you can't say anything about it. Guess why? Because I'm God and you're not. Okay? And so we talked about that so weeks ago when, when I said that verse and rubbed against our, our skin. And it's, he says, our God is in heaven and he does as he pleases. And no one really likes freedom. Like you like your own freedom. Right? You, know, you like your own authority, but you, some people don't like you if somebody else has authority. Because then they can kind of overrule you and tell you what to do, and that's not a whole lot of fun. You know what I mean? So, but that's what Jesus says. He says, I have all authority, and I have all power, and I can exercise that power anytime and in any way that I see fit. That was his claim. Okay? That was his claim. Now, we started studying these claims, uh, going through this, these miracles of Jesus, back at the end of October for two reasons, and I want to reiterate those reasons because you've only heard it 20 times, and I want to make sure that you know. One is because there's two kinds of people. Okay, One is that there's a Christian. 
And he's already decided that Jesus is the Lord of his life. And Jesus is the Lord of her life. And, and but, you know, just get it kind of down. Yeah. Down in our faith a little bit sometimes. You need a little bit of a boost. And, and I can, you know what? Jesus understands that. Jesus understands that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the person who's never made a decision who their Lord and Savior is. And people are searching. They're trying to figure out what they need some hope. They need, a, they need some help. Everyone's hurting, and, and they need some help with things. And so people are searching. So what we want to do is just give you information so you can make a decision on your own. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to her. Don't listen to him. Listen to God. Here's the Bible. This is what he did. Okay. We don't want to say, God, prove yourself. He's like, I'll prove it. Let me show you who I'm at, who I am. And that way you can make a decision, a quality decision of your own. Now, for the Christian, the one who's already made a decision, uh, we want to witness these miracles, the power of Jesus, uh, because we want to not only see that he's got a tremendous resource available, but we also want to see his willingness to flex for me. I want to know not only that you have the ability to do these things, you have the strength to do these things, but that you're willing to do these things for me, okay? And that's very, very important, because uh, sometimes we make choices in our life, right? You make a choice. And we let me some, some expectations upon this decision that it's going to turn out a certain way. And if it doesn't exactly turn out the way you think it's going to, we can maybe lose a little confidence in our choices, right? You start second-guessing yourself. I do it all the time. You start second-guessing your decision. You start second-guessing your choice. And God, he knows that that's what we do. That's the way we are. And so we see his miracle power. We've got these issues. And we see what he's done. We see that he's got the power. We see that he's willing to exercise these resources on people's behalf. It kind of reinforces our decision to follow him. And we need that on occasion. As a matter of fact, we need that a lot. We need that a lot. What happens is we see the miracles of Jesus. I know it has been for me. It builds my confidence in him. It builds my confidence in him that he'll be there for me. In every facet of my life. Because we all come in with different stuff. We've got stuff going on in our life. We need to know that this Jesus that we've called our called by name to be our Lord and Savior, our help, will actually be there in our time of great need. We're all that way. Now, uh, when we first started this, I asked you guys a question, and, you, and I didn't ask you to raise your hand, and I please don't do it, don't do it tonight either. But I just want to re-ask the question. Uh, I had mentioned early on that Jesus has all these incredible resources at his disposal. That he can do amazing things. And that's awesome, right? That's incredible. But there's a difference between having the resources and having the willing, the willing heart. The willingness to use those, those resources. Remember I asked you, some of you may have enough money in the bank to pay somebody else's mortgage payment this month. Remember I asked you that? I don't want to see your hands. But some of us have enough money in the bank that we could actually pay someone's mortgage payment. This for just this month. They're, they're a great need. You're really not. You could pay it. The question is, is how many of you will do that? That's, that? that's the difference between good and great. You know what I'm saying? And Jesus, he has all these, you know, he's got a cattle, of, he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all this stuff. Okay, great. He can do all this stuff. He's got all this power and resource at his disposal, but really use it for me. And that's what makes him so incredible. And we see that in Jesus as we study the miracles. I just want to jog your memory a little bit. You remember the Roman soldier? He's got this near-death, paralyzed servant across town in a different town, and the Roman soldier comes up to Jesus, and he's begging with him. He's like, hey, listen, this is what's going on with this kid. He's sick. He's dying. Would you come? Now, would you say that Jesus was kind of busy back then? He was busy, right? Maybe he was tired. Maybe he was hungry. He had a lot of things to do. People were pulling at him. You ever feel that way? People are pulling at you in a hundred different directions. How many people you were pulling at Jesus? Everywhere he went, there was a crowd, right? And they were asking him this and asking him that. Heal this, feed me, heal me, do this, do this, do this, do this, right? And so, but what does Jesus say? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I'm willing. I'll go heal him. No problem. My, one of my favorite stories in the cover was the leper. Remember the leper was back in uh, Matthew 8. The leper, the social and religious outcast of the society, living beyond the gates, if he comes near people, covering his face and saying, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, don't come near me. And to engage this person would be absolute taboo. You don't touch them, you don't talk to them. They're filthy, dirty, and they're outcasts. And Jesus, who's, he's a rabbi, right? He's steeped in centuries of the Jewish religion, and he goes and engages this guy and touches this guy. And the guy says, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus just cuts him right off. I am willing. 
I am willing. See, he has the ability to heal him, but he's willing to heal him. That's what makes him so great. The same story over in Mark chapter 1, verse 41, it says the same thing. Jesus goes, I'm willing. But the statement just before it is the thing we need to focus on. Why was he willing? It says that Jesus was moved by compassion. He was moved by compassion. That's why he was willing to engage this guy and to possibly be shunned by everyone in town. Everyone in the Jewish nation would possibly shun this Jesus. But he didn't care because he was moved with compassion. I throw another definition up there for you, okay? Compassion. You got to know what compassion is, all right? Uh, and, and as you're reading that, just know about, here's another one, John 14, 14. Jesus, uh, before he feeds everybody, since he was moved by compassion and he healed him. Compassion means this. It's a sympathetic consciousness of another's distress. But it doesn't end there. It's coupled with a desire to alleviate it. And what I mean by a sympathetic consciousness, it means that not only did Jesus become very aware of your distress, aware of the people's problem, but he actually felt it and carried it with them. Like he didn't just he didn't just walk into Jerusalem, see them all hurting, and say, man, they're just, they're really having a hard time over there. No, he felt it in his own heart so much that it made him cry. He wept because he saw that they were hurting people. He carries the burden with his people. He feels your pain, he knows your suffering, and he wants to fix it. That's who Jesus Christ is, okay? He is a compassionate man. Now, here's the thing. If he's compassionate, then who else should be compassionate? All of us, right? The Bible says that we should have the same attitude as Christ in Philippians 2. It says we're supposed to be like in Romans 8.29. God's desire for all of us is to be like his son. So if Jesus Christ is moved with compassion, if Jesus Christ looks at people and feels their pain and feels their problems and carries it with him and then decides, I've got to do something to help this, shouldn't that be the way we are? That's the way we should be. Uh, Jesus Christ is moved with compassion. Now i got to tell you something. Um, I, 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 I get up here and I bark at you guys all the time, but I want to stop and I also want to give credit where credit is due. I think that this church, that you guys, are very compassionate people. I don't think that, um, well, we say we don't have, a, we don't do a lot of advertising. We don't put billboards up anymore. We're not putting hangers on people's doors. We're not doing that kind of stuff. We're not putting ads on TV and on the radio. And I think that pretty much everyone who sits in this church at this point is here because you're in a place that you love and you see the value in it. And because you see the value in it, you are moved by compassion and you see people that you love and you want them to share that same blessing that God has given you. And so you've invited them to come to your church to top, come and taste and see that the Lord is good because you care about it. So I want to give you credit. I think you're very compassionate people, but I'm not saying that to let you off the hook. Let our compassion begin to swell more and more and more. And by God's grace, it will. Jesus Christ is willing. Jesus Christ is, of course, able. But let me just say this last thing, too, about compassion. compassion your compassion must be the same as Jesus in this way, in that it must outweigh the cultural norms and standards. You have to be like Jesus Christ when he was willing to engage the leper and face being shunned by all people. We must be willing to do the same exact thing. And they will hate you, right, because they hated him. And people will think you're crazy when you reach out to the least of them. But that's what Jesus Christ did. He was moved by compassion. He felt, he didn't just see it. He didn't just hear it. He felt the pain and distress of his people, and he was moved to help alleviate the problem. And that's the way we should be as well. That's the way we should be as well. Now, the first thing is that Jesus is extremely compassionate. And we should be too. But here's the thing. Here's another thing that I just... I, I, we could... We might 20 weeks, like, so I could talk about a million different things here tonight. But I don't want to do that. I'm just, I, I did my best. I prayed. I said, what, what are the main points? I only got three things. Okay? The second thing is that Jesus was always on mission. Jesus was always on mission. That man lived with massive intentionality and purpose in every single thing that he did. 
he hardly ever just stumbled upon things and just kind of, you know, it wasn't like he was out on the boat and said, oh, well, well we, well, we ran into these guys out there while we were fishing, and oh, they look like they have a problem, let's help them. He didn't do that. He was, he was nurturing situations. He was pursuing situations. He was looking for opportunities to bless and help. That's who Jesus Christ was. We see this uh, massive example of this. Uh, if you read from Mark 4.35 to 5.20, it's the story we shared. Uh, I think I actually went two weeks with this. It was the guy, the guy in, that was out there in the cemetery, the crazy freak, who was like uh, the demon possessed, naked, cutting himself, screaming lunatic that was out there in the cemetery. You know what I'm talking? You remember that guy? He's the guy that was so nasty and ugly that you know scared everybody in town. You couldn't go there. He was so possessed by the demon, and that evil was so strong in him that when the, the authorities tried to shackle him with chains and handcuffs, he actually busted the chain. That's how evil that guy was. And he was, if you want to talk about the least of them, right? The least of this guy was a crazy man. He was cutting himself. He was screaming, howling at the moon at night. This guy was insane, crazy. And on top of it, he was a Gentile. And so what does Jesus do? He's busy, right? He's doing his ministry thing over there. He's healing and helping everybody. And what does he do? Guys, let's get in the boat and let's go across the lake. It wasn't like, hey, you know, I'm tired. Let's just do a little fishing. Although that's a good idea. Okay? It wasn't like that. It was, guys, let's get in the boat and go. And, and so he purposely goes across the lake. Now, if you read the story, if you remember back, the story says that as soon as he gets done with what we're going to talk about, as soon as he gets done casting out the demon and helping this guy, what does he do? He gets back into the boat and goes directly back to where he came from. Now, what does that mean? What does that tell us? Okay, it wasn't like he went over here and your wife calls and says, where are you at? Oh, I'm in Walmart. Okay, you're at Walmart. Why are you at Walmart? You know, office depot right across the street. Could you pick up this? And oh, you know, Hobby Lobby's right there too, so I need some of this. Could you? No, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like, while you're out, go help the demon-possessed guy. Guys, let's get in the boat. Let's go over here. We're going to heal this guy, and then we're going to go right back to where we were. That was the one reason why he went there. He was on mission, on purpose. He lived with intention, and that's the way we should be. Luke 19 tell, 19.10 tells us exactly the mission of Jesus. I came to seek and save that which is lost. And that's exactly what he exemplified in that story. When he gets in the boat, he purposely goes there to seek out this man who was absolutely hurting and save him. That's what he did. And then when he's done, right back to work. It wasn't a mistake that he was there. He went on purpose. Now, isn't it great to know that Jesus is that kind of guy? It's good. It's very good to know that that's that kind of that, that Jesus is, is moved with compassion. He's a super nice guy. Bless you. It's nice to know that he, bless you again, he was always on mission. He was always working. He was always helping. It's nice to know that that's who he was. But knowledge without effect is completely worthless. It's completely worthless. I mean, it's nice to know that Jesus is that kind of guy, but if it doesn't affect anything, then it's, it's just really worthless. If it doesn't cause any change in you, it's worthless. Doesn't mean anything to you. It's gonna mean something to somebody, but it certainly should mean something to you. You're the one sitting here, right? So it should mean something to you. Let me give you some meaning. Let me let me help you with that. Romans 8 29, I mentioned a moment ago, it tells us that God's desire is that we would be like Jesus. I mean that's what it says, right? But again, another Bible verse that is absolutely worthless if you don't know what Jesus is like. Right? If you don't know what Jesus is like, how can you become like him? And so in here, we, it sheds great light on, on it for us. What is Jesus like? If you want me to become like him, what do you want me to be like? Well, Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. So, wait a minute then. What should we do then? It kind of makes sense. It's really clear now. I didn't know. I didn't know what I was supposed to do with my life. No one gave me a job description. Now you have one. Now you have a reason to live. It's to seek and save that which is lost. And here's the, now this is what Jesus says. He follows it up. John 20, 21, he says this. He goes, just as the Father sent me, so I send you. 
So, so how did the Father send them? What was his reason for coming here? Why did he step down from his throne in heaven and come down to engage Mother Earth? Why? Oh, he's just mine. Seek and save. Right? That's why Daddy sent Jesus, right? And Jesus said the same thing. Daddy sent me for this. I'm now sending you for this. That's what we were supposed to be. You're supposed to live with intention. When you wake up in the morning every day for the rest of your life, and no one's excluded, if you're a Christian, no one's excluded. Age doesn't matter. Health doesn't matter. Money and wealth doesn't matter. Every day you're supposed to get up with one sole purpose. You can do a lot of things to get to this one thing, but what's the reason you live? To seek and save. He said, the way I send you, the way he sent me, I send you. Just the same thing. Seek and save, seek and save, seek and save. Here's what happened. Go back and ask it. Back in Genesis, right? Back in Genesis, and God creates the heavens and the earth. And it's awesome. Everything's full. And then all of a sudden, he kicks back into the recliner, and he says, man. He like, he, he brags. He says, man, this is very good. I did one heck of a job here. And he did. And it was beautiful. But then all of a sudden, man, Adam and Eve, Guys can play with girls, girls can play with guys, whatever you want. I wasn't there. They sinned. And see, what happened is, is that when they sinned, not only were they subject to the curse, but the Bible tells us that all creation against its will was subjected to this curse. See, trees never sinned. Water never sinned. The Grand Canyon and the mountains and the snow and the clouds and the stars and the sun, it, those things never sinned. It never caused a problem. Everything was getting along really well. Everything was good until man jack up, jacks up the whole thing. And, and, and because we messed up, God cursed the situation. Like, oh, you messed up and now the earth is cursed. Because the, everything was working together. People were getting along. People and animals were getting along. Trees and grass were getting along. Everything was going well, right? But we were all in this together. We were one creation. And when one part gets jacked up, what, what happens? What happens when one ball bearing in a wheel goes bad? The whole, the whole wheel gets messed up, right? And that's what happened. One ball bearing, one, went bad. And it jacked up the whole thing. And, and, and so the Bible tells us that all of creation is in pain now. That there's pain and decay. And all of creation is literally groaning. Have, have you ever gone, this is awful, but have you ever gone to like the emergency room or maybe a hospice when someone's at the end of their life and the cancer's real and you just hear it, you walk by the room, you've heard it, right? Oh, they're just an agonizing pain. Oh, they're just groaning. And, you know, the Bible says that, that that's what's happening, that the trees and the earth and the dirt, and the walruses, and, 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 and the squirrels, and, and the elk, and the stars, and, and moisture. Everything is groaning because everything is just busted. It's hurting. And so what happens, God so loves his creation that he sends his son to seek and save because if he seeks us out and he saves us, the Bible says that there's hope. This is what's going to happen. It's not going to groan anymore. It, it's waiting and it's groaning and it's hurting for that glorious day when Jesus comes back to make all things right with us again and then everything is restored. And no more groaning. No more pain. That we are also groaning. We're hurting. Like, I'm saved. I'm, I'm good. It's awesome. I'm going to be in heaven and all that kind of good stuff. Okay? And I know, I think pretty much everyone in, in here is. But you know things are jacked up, right? It, it, it doesn't take a brain surgeon. You, it's, I get frustrated about a lot of different things, you know? Stuff spills on the floor and just curse creation. You know what I mean? Like, I was trying to buckle Jameson into her seat on the way here, and I'm just cursing mankind. I'm like, are you freaking kidding? This is the best you can come up with, people? These straps, if I can't get around my kid, and you know what? They're all black. Why is that? Why are they all black when it's a thousand degrees out and you put a kid in a 
seat with black buckles made out of plastic. Now that's brilliant, right? That's brilliant. Stupid mankind, we are groaning in pain. So this is what happens, God loves this creation so much, so he sends Jesus to seek and save, and then he saves us, and then he sends us to continue this mission until the last person is told, and then he comes back, and he saves it all, and he stores it all back to good again. Come Lord Jesus, right? Come Lord Jesus, today I saw something online. I want to freak you guys out. And, and listen, I, I, you can put stuff, you can see stuff online, and it may not be truth at all. So I'm just throwing it out there, okay? But listen, listen, I'm just throwing stuff out there, right? I want you to see this, but listen. The Bible says, listen, listen, listen. The Bible says that all of creation is groaning since this curse, since we jacked it all up. That all of creation, trees, birds, animals, water, mountains, dirt, stars, clouds, everything is groaning in pain because of what we did, right? That's what it says. Watch this.
And so even if you don't believe me, believe in the miraculous works I've done, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Can I give you another one? John 14, 10 and 11. You ready? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You know what? If you don't, he says, at least, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. And so that's why he does these miracles. Is it to cure cancer? Is it to give sight? Is it to give hearing back? Is it the miraculous things that you see in churches all over the world about people's legs growing back and they're getting up out of their wheelchairs? Now, does that happen? Sure. It can. God does these things. I believe that he does. But is that why he does these miracles? Just to do that? Now, he's moved by compassion. He wants to help you. But what's the great reason why he does these things? Is it the end game right there? Are we pursuing the miracle? Are we pursuing this end game of the healing? I don't believe so. John 6, 29 tells us the end game. It wraps up every single thing in those two verses, and he just says this. I'm doing this so that you will believe in the one God sent. That's why I'm doing it. Every single miracle that we've gone over for the last 20 weeks was for one purpose. It, it was to bring glory to Him. Like He did things because He loves us, and you benefit from those things. But that's not the reason. That's not the one main reason why He did it. He did it so that you would believe in the one God sent. You see what I'm saying? It's always been about Jesus. This book is a book about Jesus Christ. The, the ancient Jews were studying the scriptures and Jesus comes and says, you study it day and night to find eternal life. And all the while it just points to me. Everything about this book and everything in it points to Jesus Christ. It points to Jesus Christ. One of my favorite verses in all scripture is, is Colossians 1. Well, actually one of my favorite books in the Bible is Colossians. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Colossians 1. And one of my favorite verses is 116, where it says everything was made by him and for him. Every single thing was made with a purpose. It doesn't just exist. It's there for a reason, right? It's there for a reason. And, and, and this year, when he talks about the miracles, it says that everything that I've done, it should point to you, you know, trusting and believing in me. That's why you exist. You exist for one reason. And all this miracle stuff that we study all points to one thing. <coughs> Worship. That's it. It points to one thing. That you would believe in the one that God sent. Every single thing that he did was to point to himself. He's a complete egomaniac. And he has the right to be one. Every single thing he did was to point attention and worship to himself. That's why he did these miracles. None of Jesus' miracles and none of the miracles that he still performs today through his people are to terminate on themselves. You're not supposed to go, wow, he did, he grew a
had one intention, one intention, and that was to create greater worship in the recipient and or the witness. Anyone who received a great blessing from God in one of these stories, it was not just to receive it, it was to receive it and then give credit to the one who performed it. And anyone who saw it too, same thing, to give credit to the one who performed it. Every single story in here was so that people would worship him more, greater worship in the one who receives or sees. All that Jesus does for us and all that Jesus gives to us should never terminate on itself. We are not to worship creation. We are to worship the creator exclusively. That is it. Okay? That is it. Um, you know, grass grows. Cows eat it. We eat them. Praise God. Right? Do you know? Here's the thing. Do you know the Hindus? I'm not ripping on Hindus, but they worship cows. They, they, no, you're supposed to eat them, dude. You're supposed to eat them, right? And, and, and here's the thing. Cows are yummy. Right? Sorry. Cows are yummy. Cows are yummy. Right? Cows are yummy. Right? But here's the thing. I was talking to Meredith about this yesterday. Food didn't have to be yummy, did it? You don't eat that, but you have food that you like, right? You have food that you like? What's your favorite food? Fish. Yummy, right? What's your favorite food? Figures, yeah. That was a long shot. Huh? What's your favorite food? Chicken. You know what's amazing? Um, God could have, like, we need food to eat, right? We need food to live. You can't, if you don't eat, you die, right? That's an easy one, right? He could have just made it where, like, okay, I'm hungry, I'll eat, and then I'll live. Like, like water, right? You got water right there? Like, it has no, what, can you imagine if everything that you ate tasted like water? What's that? Well, Meredith said that'd be good because then I wouldn't have this extra 20. That's what she told me, right? right? But here, here's the thing. Even water, right? Even water, when you're hot and sweaty, right? Well, he didn't need to do that. He didn't need to give you taste buds. He didn't need to, he didn't need to make your food yummy. He didn't have to make chicken yummy. He didn't have to make spaghetti sauce yummy. He didn't have to, but you know what? He did. He did, right? He made stuff yummy. He didn't need to do that, but he did. Glory to God, right? Glory to God. We should be rejoicing about these things, okay? All these things are awesome. Uh, uh, how about sunsets? We talked about this too. Sunsets serve no practical, natural, nothing, no purpose whatsoever, unless, unless they're just up there so we can acknowledge how awesome he is, right? We're, everything should, should uh, like go up. In worship, right? It's not like, oh, look at the pretty sunset, right? Anyone can say, look at the pretty sunset, but you know why he does it? Look at the pretty sunset that God made. He's awesome. Look at how creative and beautiful it is. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Like, they serve no purpose except that, maybe. Worship. Everything should go upward, okay? Um, how about sex with your spouse, right? Sex with your spouse, right? Uh, it's fun, okay? But, but seriously, right? I don't want to be gross, but, but seriously, it's fun. It, you get to enjoy visual beauty. You get to enjoy each other, right? And then the girls have, listen, this, this is some statistic. Down in certain areas, they have 8,000 nerve endings there. 8,000 nerve endings. And men have 4,000 nerve endings in their area. Okay? Praise God, right? <laughs> have some more, uh, we need to procreate here. Honey, let's go procreate. Like, yeah, right? let's go procreate. Yeah. <laughs> what if it didn't feel good? But it does. But it does, right? It does. He didn't have to do that. He could have just made you work on instinct, like, I mean, like the other animals that don't know any better. It feels good. It's like flavorful food, right? Praise God. You see, when, so when you just have sex and it feels good, and you just, that's it. You don't acknowledge the fact that he put 4,000 nerve endings over here and it feels awesome. You thank the one who gave you the nerve endings. Am I the only one in here? Seriously? Is that why so many kids? I know that you agree with me. Come on. Right? I got one. One. If Ken was here, we'd have two. You need to tell them to get to work. You're not married. Shut your mouth. 
There's airplanes out there. Worship. We're supposed to worship God. When you, when it, listen, if the fact that it feels good, shouldn't we be thankful? None of us had anything to do with that. Do you realize that, right? No one had anything to do with that. He did that so it was for our enjoyment. That's awesome, right? That's awesome. But not just the sexual part of it. Any intimacy with husband and wife, that's from God too. You know, the Bible says about two becoming one. You know what I mean? You didn't have anything to do with that either. It says what God brings together, let no man separate. He's the one. So when you enjoy the intimacy with your spouse, guess what? Glory to God. We should be thanking Him for that. That's worship. That's worship, okay? Uh, sports, same thing. I love sports, right? Pig skin, grass, talent from these players. None of us had anything to do with that either, right? All of that is because God gave those things to us. And so instead of going, yeah, look at that guy. He's a, look at LeBron. He's awesome. No. How about the one who gave him the talent? How about the one who gave him the height so he could actually play a bet, uh, basketball? You know, so we need to, everything should be to glorify God. He does everything for him. He does everything for him. How about art and music? Music is art. How about, like, all these people that, that are able to express uh, th themselves and painting and sculpture and, and then music and stuff like that. Like, we shouldn't give any credit to these guys. Like, they had nothing. No one, no one said, like, you know, let's go procreate a musician. We're, we're just going to go, let's just go make a guitarist right now. I mean, who's, who does this? Nobody does this, right? So when someone has the talent and ability to perform some type of, a, you know, an ability of music or art, some other type of art, what is it? Glory to God who gave that talent, right? That's, that's everything that happens is to worship Him more. So if you're a recipient, if you're the, if you're the good guitarist, what you should be doing? Worshiping God, thanking Him for it. If you get to hear the guitarist, what do you do? Do you say, Harry, you're awesome. Or do you, or do you thank God who gifted Harry and gave us even the opportunity to have the ears to hear that stuff? That's a gift from God. And that's what we should do. Everything should be worship. Our children, same thing. Rolls up to worship. We should be thanking them for our children. And then we should honor him by teaching our children about him, to know him, and to love him, and to serve him. Everything that happens should be for greater worship. The miracles are never the end game. They're never the focus that we should have. The most impressive miracles, I know what you guys think. What do you think of the most impressive miracles that Jesus performs? Walking on water? Raising dead, raising dead? I agree. I love that. Raising, that's crazy, right? <laughs> crazy. I think that's the greatest ones. Those are like big high impact stuff, right? He's raising dead people. I just spit everywhere. You see that? He's raising, I'm going to make mud and I'm going to heal someone right now. Okay, so he's raising dead people, right? Raising dead people is incredible. But Jesus Christ himself in John 11 says this, and when he's going to raise Lazarus, what does he say? I'm doing this so that the Son of God gets glory. Even the greatest of miracles was not just because he was trying to help Lazarus. He was doing it by product, less Lazarus. But the ultimate reason why he did it is so that the Son of God would be glorified to worship. By everyone, by Lazarus and everyone who witnessed it. And now everyone who has heard the story proclaimed to them. Uh, John 20, verse 30 and 31 says this. Um, Paraphrase that there's many more miracles that Jesus performed. But these miracles that we've seen in the, in the Bible, we've gone through for 20 weeks now, they have been journaled down into the Bible for one reason, so you believe in Him. That's the only reason. That's what it says. If you read John 20, 30 and 31, it says that these miracles are put in here so that you would believe in Him and have life. That's why it's in there. That's why He performed all these things, to bring worship to Himself. Now, I said that there was two different types of people. There was Christians who needed a bump. And, and listen, I don't know about you, but more so than ever. I guess I, was, I told Mark and, and, uh, and Eric, who was back there, uh, when I got here, I said, I'm just excited. Uh, I'm, I love doing this, and I love sharing the Bible, but I was excited tonight to share the Bible with you. 
And I guess it just all kind of, kind of came together for me. I was just, I'm excited because I believe in Jesus more now. I spent 20 weeks preparing and sharing this stuff with you. And because I was sharing this, I'm encouraged. Like, I don't think at this point that there's anything that Jesus can't do. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I believe that he can do it all because it was a variety of things that he covered. And there was nothing that was too strong for him, even death. He can conquer death, not only Lazarus' death, but his own, right? He lifted himself from the grave. Like, nothing can conquer this guy, right? So I can walk through life courageous because I know that Jesus is going to be with me to the end of the age. And so I know he can conquer all these things. He does have the power, and so I have confidence. And I hope that you do too. I feel good about it. I feel good about being a Christian again. I feel confident in the choice that I made. And sometimes I get down. Sometimes I start second-guessing my choice. But I'm not there right now. I'll be there again. Yeah. I'll be there again. And you know what we'll have to do? Go back and read them again. And be encouraged yet again. But right now I feel really, really good about my decision to follow Jesus. I feel very confident in my decision to follow Jesus. I feel very confident that he is God of God's. But there was another person. There was the non-Christian. What about him? What about her? It's the same thing. We, we all need something to believe in. We all need something to help us. We're all, every single person is looking for some help. Nobody is like born awesome and, sorry. Nobody's born awesome and they just don't need any help. Everybody needs something. Everybody needs something. And you know what? Whether you believe in Jesus or not, no matter what you believe in, you're worshiping something. There's something in your world, whether you're a follower of Christ or you're a follower of anything else, you're easily giving yourself up to that thing, whatever it is, that person, that thing, whatever. You're giving yourself up to it. All your resources are easily going to that thing. And you're looking for help and hope in that thing. And I don't know if it's Jesus yet. I hope it will be. But you're giving yourself up to something. And everybody needs to make a choice as to what they're going to worship. And so what we've done is we've taken 20 weeks to go through specific things, all these miracles, boom, 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 to prove who he is, that you would believe, so that you would do that one thing, and that's to worship Jesus as God. 20 weeks, we went through his resume of raising dead people, of walking on water, of looking at a storm that was threatening to kill everyone, and they were freaking out, scared. We're going to die! We're going to die! And Jesus just wakes up and goes, be still. Glass. People are hungry. He multiplies the happy meal and makes a buffet out of it. <laughs> People are blind. He spits on them. They're healed. They can't hear. He pops their ears. They can hear. They can't speak. He puts spit on their tongue. Now they can talk. They're demon-possessed. He kicks the demons out of them. They have a temperature. He touches them. They're better. She's got a blood hemorrhage. She touches them. She, he stops and all the poor, the, 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 the healing power drains out of them, and she's better. The guy's lowered down through the roof. He's paralyzed. He forgives, forgives his sins, and the guy picks up his mat and walks home. And this is one thing after another. He proves himself. Who sits on your throne? It's the only question that matters. 20 weeks means nothing. Unless you make a decision to put Jesus on the throne of your life. That's it. So I just, you know, got up here and screamed for 20 weeks to get to this one question that we've asked last week, but I asked you again. Who sits on your throne? Who sits on your throne? We worship the Creator or we worship His creation. Whatever it is. It's either Jesus or anything else. Jesus is the creator. Everything else in heaven and on earth is his creation. So you've got to choose. Which one is it going to be? Who sits on your throne? Who sits on your throne? Will you see the truth and refuse it? Will you harden your heart? When you take this evidence that's been provided for you for the last 20 weeks, and, and now I'm talking to believers as well, because myself included, so I'll put a mirror in front of me. I can say that Jesus is my Savior, but I'm not always, I don't always say that Jesus is my Lord. Because 
I really don't trust him. Let's be honest. If we really trusted him, then he would impact every choice we make and we would honor him with every choice we made absolutely fearlessly. If this guy can raise people from the dead, why do we not think he can take care of our little insignificant nothing? So, will you accept him and put him on the throne of your life? Or will you suppress the truth and unrighteousness? Will you take the evidence that's been provided and acknowledge that Jesus does share your distress and wants to alleviate it? And that Jesus does have the power to judge, control, command, and determine all things. Do you believe that all creation must submit to the voice of the Creator, Jesus Christ? Which includes you. Jesus Christ made claims a long time ago that he'll build his church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he said, I do, listen, I will build it because I am the boss of everything. He said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. So the question is, is will you surrender to him or will you suppress him? Now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make no bones about it. Look, I, I know everybody in this place right now, and I know and love you all. But I'm going to pray, and, and I'm going to spit. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to be very, like, deliberate. Like, I'm not going to hide or sugarcoat a thing. Okay? I'm going to, I'm going to pray, and, and, and maybe what I'm going to pray is going to sting you because there's an area of your life that you don't, you have not yet given to Jesus. Okay? So... I might say something, and you might get mad at me, but I don't care because I love you enough to pray with you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that you would um, bow your heads, and I want to pray with you um, for your surrender. I want to pray for your surrender. Lord, I, I, I want to thank you first for, um, for the privilege of studying your word to study the Gospels these uh, last 20 plus weeks, really, in preparation. Um, I thank you for, uh, for refreshing my faith, helping me realize that there's nothing on, on earth, that there's nothing in all of heaven that is more powerful than you. Lord, I thank you for helping me to surrender to you in a greater way. I, I surrender to you in a greater way today here as we were singing to you, and it was so refreshing. I thank you for that. Um, Father, I would ask that you would give us a greater compassion like Jesus has. Help us to, uh, to be aware of the people that are around us that are hurting. Help us to not only be aware of the people that are around us that are hurting, but birth inside of our heart a greater desire to alleviate their problem, to alleviate their distress, to alleviate their suffering. All that is wrapped up in the mission of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be on mission, not just like Jesus, but to be on mission with Jesus, to be actively pursuing the purpose for which we were created, is to make you known that you might receive more worship. Help us to wake up every morning and to live out the purpose for our existence. You tell us that we were created for you. So you, you've given us identity in that. You've given us purpose in that. You've given us a mission to accomplish. To have compassion for people and to go seeking opportunities to save.
Father has sent the Lord Jesus, so the Lord Jesus sends us. Help us, Father, also to serve others in a way that points to Jesus. I was thinking about this today as we continue to pray, the word compassion. I see two words in the word compassion. I see compass and I see passion. I don't think there's a mistake there. I think that the Bible is very deliberate in using the word compassion because our greatest energies and resources, the thing that we're, the thing that we're most jazzed about, most energized about, the thing we pour the most of ourselves into, that's our passion, and it has a compass. It should point people to Jesus. Everything that we do should point people to Jesus. And so, Father, I would ask you for this church, for Revolution Church, to help us to not be satisfied with the status quo of our own heart. The people out there, to not be satisfied with the status quo of our own heart. Seeking to please ourselves, seeking to take care of our own things. Help us to not be satisfied with that. Remind me of the song that says, break our heart with the things that break yours. That's what I would ask you would do in all of us here. Use our church to redeem this city. Thank you.